so we are back in the in the evenings um, over the next four weeks we will be looking at this little book of Ruth um, we're following on the path basically through the Bible last year we kicked off with judges so this year we're kicking off with the book of Ruth um, Ruth is the next book on from Judges in our English Bibles, and it follows in the same time period. It follows in this time period of the Judges. That's the first thing we're told in the book. But in the Hebrew Bible, the book of Ruth actually doesn't follow the same pattern. In the Hebrew Bible, it is not considered part of these books like Judges, Samuel, and Kings. It's actually much later in the canon. It's near the end of the Old Testament in, in the Hebrew, and it's grouped together with writings like uh, Song of Songs, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, and Esther. Um, all that to say that if when we're reading the book, probably the main point it's making is not just to tell us a lot of historical facts, okay? The book is a story. It's, it's quite a short story. You can read it in, in one sitting. But I think one of the things that, that we know from the fact that it's grouped with these other books is that the story is the point, in a sense, right? We're not looking mainly for historical detail. We're looking for what is the story saying and what is the the message of the story that in a sense will go beyond its context will go beyond um the context that we've written and, and i hope we will see the story and see the point of it as we go through the book together over the next few weeks so before i go any further we are going to read all of ruth chapter one um it's not too long so we're going to read all of that and then we'll continue okay ruth chapter one and verse one in the days when the judges ruled there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. They lived there about 10 years, and both Malon and Kilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to, your mo to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they, and they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb, that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi, when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. And that's what we're going to read. So, the book of Ruth opens with a series of tragedies in the life of Naomi and Elimelech. They flee Israel from Moab at the start after a period of famine with their two sons. The two sons go on to marry Moabite women, and they stay from, in Moab for quite some time after this before both her husband and her two sons die. Now, in modern times, these would be tragic events for anyone. 
but I think there's another level that this is working at that we have to understand if we're to understand the depth of what has happened to Naomi. And we must understand, what we must understand for this is the importance in the culture of children, right? The big thing at the moment, at the very start of Ruth, is that there are no children. The sons have died and they have not had any kids. If we're going to understand the rest of the book of Ruth and the point it's trying to make, we must remember that in this context, children are not just a joy and a gift in the same way we think of them now. Children in this time period are the only way you have of keeping your name alive after you die. They're the only evidence after you live that you existed. They are like your eternal life. Their life is an extension of yours in a sense. By them, by them outliving you, living beyond you, it's like you don't die. It's like you live on in them. So in this context, the loss of Naomi's two sons is beyond tragic. It's disastrous. It's catastrophic. She hasn't just lost her family. She's lost her life. She's lost all her hope. Everything she, pour, she has poured her life into at this point has been taken from her suddenly. She has, in her mind, no hope of having a fruitful life. Her sons have been taken from her, and they should have been the ones to, to grow up and to work the land, and then they would have more sons, and they would grow up and work the land, and they would be the means of providing for them economically. No one will be there to provide for her into her old age. Um, she has no future, no hope, and no prospect of anyone, remem of anyone remembering that she even existed after she's gone. So one of the first things that this book draws our attention to right at the start is the way in which Naomi and her family respond to what happens to them. The ways in which they respond to the pain that comes. And this book is obviously dealing with some quite extreme forms of pain, like, like bereavement and famine. And the, the principles apply to those things as well. But I think the principles of how we respond to pain don't just apply to extreme pain. They also are relevant to, if you like, the everyday pain of life. Pain like having to go to a job every day that you hate. Pain like taking care of kids who are difficult. Pain like difficult relationships. Pain like ongoing health problems. How do we respond to these things? How we respond to pain teaches us an awful lot about what we think of God. At the end of this chapter in Ruth, Naomi tells the people to no longer call her Naomi, but to call her Mara. Because in her words, God has dealt very bitterly with me. And the word Mara should tell us an awful lot about how Naomi is actually feeling. Um, you probably are already aware, Naomi means pleasant and Mara means bitter. So Naomi is saying, God's flipped the story of my life. Uh, the word Mara actually comes up in a, quite a famous story earlier on in the Bible. Um, in Exodus 15, after Israel has been led out of Egypt, um, one of the first struggles they face in the wilderness is that they, they have no water and the water is bitter and they start to complain against God. And the waters of Mara, the bitter water that they can't drink, is like the first episode in the wilderness where Israel starts to complain against God, where they start to basically start to question, is God really for us? Is God really on our side? Is God being fair toward us? And they start to act with bitterness toward God. And when we read this word in the book of Ruth, it's meant to be drawing our attention back to that. It's meant to be calling our attention to these same themes that continue to come up. Now, as with Naomi, bitterness for us can often be the first result when pain happens in life. Um, it can be our first reaction to it. You know, we live in, it's not the same for everyone, but we live in a relatively affluent country in comparison to the rest of the world. And in a country like this, pain is often considered to be something foreign that we don't really know how to handle. You know, we're told to either run away from it or to overcome it in our own strength. Those are the two options we're given. We're told that whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger except when it doesn't, except when it only seems to be making you weaker. And if we live in a world where we generally expect things to go well for us, then it makes sense that when pain comes, we wouldn't know how to deal with it. Our first instinct will probably be to blame the outside world and to start to become bitter. I'll give you an example uh, from my life. So about six years ago, I was going into my third year at university and I went to live in Belgium for a year. I went to live there and I went to teach English in a couple of schools there uh, in the south of Belgium as part of my course. Now over my second year at university things hadn't been going that well for me and I hadn't been very happy and I had been kind of withdrawing more and more from, from things at uni, from things at church. But I was pretty sure that it wasn't my fault, you know. I was pretty sure that it was just because of my circumstances that, you know, my professors demanded too much or university was just too weird, they just had such high expectations. 
I was pretty sure that if I started to get a change of scenery, that things would start to go better, you know? That ultimately the problem was my circumstances because it couldn't be something in me, surely. I know for the first while in Belgium, you know, things went okay. You know, I had a new place to live and work. Uh, there was people there that I could hang out with. Things were okay. A few months in, I felt quite vindicated, right? I felt like I'd proven that the problem wasn't me, it was my circumstances. And I could convince myself that really it was just that uni was the problem. People there were too weird. Except over time, um, I found the teaching in Belgium quite difficult. I found it difficult to, to be a teacher there. And the work started to wear me out. And as that happened, I started to put less effort in. I started to avoid work where I could. I started to avoid church where I could. And the people there justifiably were a bit annoyed at this, especially in the school where I was working. They were justifiably a bit annoyed that I wasn't putting the effort in. And then later on, to cap it all off, my phone was stolen. <laughs> And suddenly, Belgium was the problem. Suddenly, what I really needed was to get out of Belgium and find a new place. And I started to sort of fantasize at that time about going to live in like America or something, because things would start to go well there, surely. And all this time, I was just curling in on myself. I was just convincing myself more and more that the outside world was the main problem, or family or friends were the main problem. And I started to treat people badly. I started to act with bitterness toward people, but the thing about bitterness is that it only ever ultimately harms you. And it only ultimately harmed me. It started to destroy me from the inside. It started to drive me down. Because that's what bitterness does. It rots you from the inside. Because all of your hatred or disdain that's directed on the outside towards other people, other things, is often ultimately an attempt to escape from the things in you that you don't like. And from the pain in you that you want to flee from. So when you're done expressing it outwardly, it starts to come back towards you. It starts to reflect in, in towards you. And ultimately for God, it took an awfully long time. It took years, but for God to start working in my life, he had to show me that the problem wasn't my circumstances. The problem is in here. And for us to see what God is doing through pain in us, we often have to stop running from it and we have to stop blaming others for it. So how do we see these patterns work themselves out in the book of Ruth? Uh, Naomi and Elimelech's first action in the book doesn't seem that odd or doesn't seem that sinful. They flee Israel from Moab in a time of famine because there's more food in Moab than there is in Israel. What's wrong with that? Well, the thing is that when the law, we read that famine in Israel is an initial sign of God's judgment. So the correct response to famine is not flight, it's repentance. By leaving the land, they've actually exiled themselves. They brought themselves out of God's presence, willingly. Almost as if they're leaving God to get, in their minds, more favorable circumstances. So as I've already said, in this time period, um, the, the children are really everything. Your whole hope is often bound up in your children. Your future is bound up in them. Your ability to work and earn money and have someone to continue your family name is like the purpose of your life. That's what you're living for. So when Naomi's husband and both their sons die before they have any kids, it's a catastrophe. Their names will be lost, so will their inheritance, their family's land that they've owned for generations will go to others. They will have nothing and be no one. And as Naomi says in the text, she's old. She can't have just have more kids. Uh, she doesn't have the time for that. And the fact that the two sons, Malon and Kilion, at the start of the book, have been married to these girls for 10 years, and they still have no children, is very, very rare in this context. Because if children are everything, then they're kind of like the point of marriage, right? You get married to have kids in a way that isn't really true nowadays culturally. And so the fact that they still have no children after 10 years is kind of already an indicator that God is working, that he's starting to do something here. But Naomi isn't listening. She's just seeing the negatives in the whole situation. And Naomi doesn't even really seem to have any desire to return to Israel, to return to God's presence, until she hears that there's blessing in the land, until she hears that there's food in Israel again. She seems to be thinking entirely in this like consumer mentality of going where the best circumstances are, going where the food is. You know, what I will say is that it's easy for us to come down quite harshly on Naomi, but I think the point that, that it's making here is that she's acting in the normal human way. She's acting in the natural way that humans act. Each of us naturally will pursue the circumstances that we think are best for us and the most fruitful for us. We go where we think it will be best for us. We think and act just like Naomi does until 
God acts decisively in her life. So we come to this point in the story where Naomi's going back to Israel with her two daughters-in-law. And they start to, to follow her back to Israel. But Israel is God's chosen people, his chosen land. He has set them apart. Uh, they're meant to be a kingdom of priests and a light to the nations, is what Exodus tells us. Yet the only Israelite in the story at this point not only discourages the two Moabite girls from coming to know her God, but she actually actively encourages them to pursue idolatry, to go after their own Moabite gods. She's meant to be a representative. She's meant to be an ambassador for the one true God. Yet not only has she left his presence, but she's actually encouraging others not to come to him. And it takes some work, but eventually Orpah decides to stay in Moab. You know, she's sad to see her mother-in-law go, but at the end of the day, she's probably much better off in Moab. She should probably just stay. She's young. She can find another husband. Uh, she can have a comfortable, easy life with lots of kids. She's still quite young after all. She can have a bright future ahead of her. And it makes sense for her to do that. And it makes sense to Naomi, because Orpah is pursuing the most expedient situation for herself. It makes sense you know, Naomi's doing that, so she expects others to do it. She expects Orpah and Ruth to do the same thing. Life will be much easier for Orpah and Moab. She should probably just stay there and serve her own gods rather than coming to Israel to serve Naomi's and to live under his rule, the rule of a foreign god. And again, this is natural human thinking. This is natural, normal human way of acting. It makes perfect sense. And yet, if both girls had done this, we wouldn't be reading about their story thousands of years later. And Ruth's name wouldn't come up in the Messiah's genealogy several times over. Now, sometimes, you know, I don't know have you, if you've ever had one of those conversations with people where you start to talk to them about planning to do something big for God. Maybe you're making a big sacrifice financially. Maybe you're, you're deciding to go somewhere uh, to serve God. And what sometimes happens is as you talk about it, you start to get some pushback. The other person starts to seem uncomfortable and they start listing reasons why you maybe shouldn't do that. You should just, you know, pursue the best life you can find now. You know, good job, good house, good family. And obviously there's nothing wrong with any of these things. But if we are to really live the way we ought to as followers of Christ, who as the book will go on to tell us is a descendant of Ruth, then maybe we shouldn't always just do the normal, natural, safe thing. And as we see later on in the book, Ruth's story will continually, if we're reading it correctly, will continually point us to the reality of eternal life beyond this. Eternal life which is founded on the life of one man who did not do the natural, normal, safe human thing, but who left his home and his glory for the good of others, who made himself nothing to be exalted by his father. And in this story, what Ruth is about to do, Ruth's actions don't fit into Naomi's paradigms or Naomi's patterns, what she thinks people how she thinks people act in a sense and Ruth goes on to make this memorable covenantal commitment to Naomi which doesn't fit with how Naomi thinks Ruth says do not urge me to leave you or return from following you for where you go I will go and where you lodge I will lodge your people shall be my people and your God my God where you die I will die and there I will be buried may the Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts me from you what Ruth is doing is that she's almost binding herself to Naomi in a covenant She's calling God to punish her if she should ever leave her mother-in-law. And her language about having the same people and the same God as Naomi really echoes God's own covenantal language to his people repeatedly in Exodus and throughout the prophets, where he continually will say, you, be, you will be my people and I will be your God. It's meant to echo that when Ruth says this. And what the text actually says, it says that Ruth clung to Naomi, right? And that word clung is the same word you find in Genesis 2, when describing marriage and how a man leaves his father and mother to cleave to his wife. Because this is what Ruth is doing in a sense. She's binding herself to her mother-in-law until death. She's giving up everything that she had back in Moab, the easy life she could have had, to give her life in service to Naomi. Even though she knows, Ruth knows that this will be a really hard life for her. She's leaving everything she knows to go to this unknown country to serve her mother-in-law. And Ruth's self-sacrificial love for another is in complete opposite to the way Naomi thinks. Naomi is used to living for herself, for pursuing the most beneficial circumstances to meet her needs as she sees. But Ruth does the exact opposite. She goes the exact opposite direction. She gives up everything for someone else. She seeks someone else's benefit at her cost. 
the love that Ruth shows Naomi here is not a normal, natural, human kind of love. It's not the kind of love, the word love is used so much in our culture, but it doesn't, that's not what this is talking about. Um, th when we talk about this in the culture, about somebody loving someone else, it's often no love at all, but rather a desire to get something from somebody else. So often in the world around us, when people say they love one another, they're really just involved in a relationship for what they can get out of it. You know, whether it's just that they're attracted to the other person outwardly or whether they just want to be seen to associate with them so that other people will think more highly of them or even just being friends with someone for the benefit that they can be to you in your life or in your career, just for uh, even emotional benefit that you can get from them. None of these things are really love. They're just different ways of getting something from someone, of using another person. Um, it's like a consumer relationship where you're just, you're not in it for the other person's good. You're in it for what you can get out of it. But God's love is not like this, as Naomi is about to see. Now, Naomi, in verse 8, um, speaks to God, and, and she prays on God, basically, to treat the girls kindly. Um, and the word kindly is a translation of a word in Hebrew, uh, hesed, which you may, have, you may have heard of before, which is used repeatedly in the Old Testament to denote God's own eternal, promised, covenantal love to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, and all those who have put faith in Christ. This is God's love a giving love, a sacrificial love. Naomi doesn't really seem to know the God she's talking about. She, uh, she asks him to show love to them, yet God, in fact, is about to, to flip the story and to show that love to Naomi and Ruth. He's about to show Naomi what he's really like and what his love is really like. Ruth's about to become like the embodiment of God's hesed for Naomi in the story, showing her, showing her how God's love is this giving, sacrificial, covenantal love not one that is coming to get something from Naomi, but coming to give everything freely for her good. But for Naomi at this point in the story, Ruth is really an unexpected and actually quite an unwanted gift. You know, when she, she makes this great promise to Naomi, but Naomi doesn't even really react. You know, she just, she says nothing. And then she continues on uh, to Israel. It's, I can almost imagine Naomi just shrugging when, when Ruth says this to her. And what's more at the end of the chapter, when she starts to talk to the other women in Bethlehem and talk of how bitterly she has been treated, uh, she says that the Lord took her away full, but brought her back empty. What an insult that is to Ruth. Ruth has just given up everything, her whole life, to come and serve this woman. But an, an old woman, Naomi's old, she wouldn't have had, had any means to survive apart from begging. Uh, she can't work the fields. One of the points in the next chapter is that Ruth has to be the one to go and work the fields because Naomi's old and she can't. Ruth has given up her life for Naomi in a sense, yet Naomi has no real appreciation for the gift. She treats Ruth like nothing. She treats Ruth as if she isn't even there. What I think is going on here is that Naomi is actually blinded by her bitterness. She has allowed her bitterness, her feeling of being treated unjustly, to almost blind her to how God is working in her life and how he is being faithful to her. And this is what happens to us when we become bitter as well. We can become consumed by self-pity and unable to see what God is doing around us, how he's working for our good. God's love is self-sacrificial. It's a giving love, and it is meant to shatter our human paradigms, our patterns, our ways of thinking and acting, and therefore also to change the way in which we suffer when the pain comes. You know, suffering has a way of revealing what's inside us, and especially of revealing what we think of God. Um, what, you know, it shows us who we think God is. If our first reaction to pain is bitterness, then it can betray the fact that we really are not sure that God's on our side after all. You know, we can, we, it can almost betray the fact that we think God wants something from us, that he's making us suffer because he either doesn't like us or because he's wanting us to do more for him so that we can somehow earn his blessing. But a true knowledge of God's character and his love is the only thing that can carry us through the deepest valleys in our lives. And the joy that the, that the knowledge of this love gives is often brought out even more when the pain starts to come. You know, Tim Keller tells a story quite often about the, the Christian runner, Eric Liddell. Um, you may have heard about him from the, the movie Chariots of Fire. It's about Eric Liddell and quite a famous story of him at the Olympics. But after he retired from running, Eric actually went to China to serve as a missionary teacher in schools there. He went in 1925 and he remained living there through the 1940s when uh, Japan came to invade China during the Second World War. 
<clears throat> now, the Japanese invasion of China was a brutal assault. Uh, the Chinese were much poorer at the time than Japan, and they were perceived as like a lesser race. And so people were treated like animals. You know, the women were raped. Many were rounded up and placed in internment camps. And one of the people placed in internment camps was Eric Waddell. And the story goes that in these internment camps, among the many people of different social classes who came to, to stay in these camps, uh, the cruelty of the treatment that they received from the Japanese eventually started to make them cruel. You know, even those who had been good, religious, upstanding citizens before this would start to treat others cruelly and fight for their own survival in this environment, even at the cost of others. It had a way of turning even the most upstanding of citizens into, into cruel men who could mistreat others but not Eller Eric Liddell. And there are stories from others in the prison who tell how he continued to treat others with kindness, to serve them, to show love to them at his own cost, even in the most dire of circumstances. And when he died in that internment camp in 1945, the whole camp went into mourning because he had been such a light in this dark place. The point is this, a real knowledge of God's love shatters human paradigms and changes how we suffer. If we are out for our own good here and now, suffering will make no sense to us and we will probably become embittered by it as we see the hopes of our lives around us being snuffed out. But if we know the nature of God's hesed, his eternal commitment to us in Jesus Christ to seek our good at his cost and to give us an eternal hope through this, then we can learn to suffer well, to let the pain increase our hope, our joy, our longing for his return. And so the words of Romans 5 can become true of us over time, that we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So what should we do? You know, this, this kind of heart might seem quite far off, um, we often, I myself don't often feel like this is my instinct when things start to go in ways that I don't like. But I think the indication of scripture is that it does take time to develop this kind of thinking. And it is ultimately only God who can develop this heart in us through revealing his love to us in our hearts and by his spirit. The pain and the difficulties that we face in life can often be great teachers. And God so often uses pain to teach us some of the greatest lessons. You know, often the pain of disappointment and loss can drive us to God more and teach us more about the basis of our relationship with him, which is grace. His love is a gift. It is not earned. It is not wages. Uh, it's quite instinctive for us sometimes to, to deal with God on a kind of barter basis by bargaining with him, to assume that uh, the basis of our relationship is that he will give us good things if we do the right things, if we do things for him. And so if things aren't going well in our lives, then our first instinct can often be that we need to you know, do more, that we need to serve more, to do more for God so that he gives us what we want. And this will inevitably lead to more anger and more frustration toward God when things continually don't go our way, even when we're trying our hardest. The world often tries to teach us that we should respond to pain by trying harder, by working harder to overcome our difficulties. And that if we do this, we should expect things eventually to start to go our way, as if the solution to every problem is just more motivation or you know trying new things or just approaching it a different way but god will sometimes bring us into situations in our lives where we encounter problems that we cannot solve by our own strength or by our own intelligence no matter how hard we try and we can end up using all of our resources to try to fix our own problems to no avail it is only when we realize that we have nothing to offer god ultimately but ourselves that we see that that is all he wanted in the first place. About three years ago, um, I went through quite a prolonged period of quite serious depression. And it took me a long time to understand this. And my first instinct when it started to descend was just to start to look for ways out or just to try harder to, to use my brain, to think, for, to think my way out of it, if you like. Um, one of the key features of depression is that it's a lot harder to think, it's a lot harder to remember things. Um, and this was especially difficult for me because up to that point, um, it had kind of been an identity for me that I was the guy who knew a lot of languages. And what happened at this time was that I started to forget a lot of words. A lot of things that I had learned just became a lot harder to remember. 
and that was incredibly difficult for me at the time. And when this was all happening, the advice you often get is that you should try harder to fix it yourself. You should, you know, whether it's being healthier or going out more, but none of this worked. And the problem just seemed to be getting worse and worse. And when I was at rock bottom, when I had tried everything I could, um, when everything wasn't working and I could barely focus or barely think straight, God showed up and he revealed himself to me in ways that I could not have imagined before. And his character and his love and who he is and what he is like, all of this just became so much more real and so much more tangible than it had ever been before. And this is the experience of so many who've had to walk through the toughest times. But God is much more real, much more tangible, much more close at hand in the valley valley than he ever is on the mountaintop. Think about people in scripture who meet God. Where does that happen? It's in the wilderness. Abraham, Jacob, Moses, Israel as a whole, they go out to the wilderness to meet God. And when God's son comes, where does he go? He goes to the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. The wilderness is so often where we have to go to meet with God in order for him to cease to be vague, to cease to be just words on a page and to start to be real, start to be great, magnificent, beautiful, and much bigger than we ever imagined him to be. Ruth shows us the nature of God's love. It shows us his eternal selfless commitment to us to work for our good at his cost. Even when we don't thank him for it, even when we don't appreciate it as we should, even when we are bitter towards him, and it is coming to know this love that gives us hope for our own times of pain and suffering and ultimately destroys bitterness in us. If God loves us like that, how can we remain bitter towards him? If he has given us everything at his own cost, if he has held nothing back, how can we stay angry at him? How can we think that he's not treating us fairly? Ruth gave up her life in Moab to come and serve Naomi. And Jesus gave up his life in heaven to come and serve us. Even when we didn't see anything desirable in him, he made himself nothing and became a man, became a servant and went to the cross for us. And seeing him do this, seeing who he is, seeing the nature of his love is what will transform us and what will ultimately transform how we suffer. So what should we do? One thing I think is important is learning not to run from the pain, not to instinctively run from it when it hits, but really learning to, to sit in it in a sense. You know, Lamentation says this, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit alone in silence when it is laid on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust, there may yet be hope. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes and let him be filled with insults. For the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not afflict from his heart to grieve the children of men. Sometimes God will bring problems into our lives that we cannot escape or solve by our own efforts. And the only thing we can really do is just to learn to sit in the pain with God and be with him in it without having any answers to the problems we're facing. It is impossible to see everything that God is doing in any one situation. We can only trust his character and his love as revealed uh, through his spirit and his word. Now, I, I should stress that what, what is not true, it, this does not make God's love a painkiller. I think, I think this took a long time for me to learn. I think I used to think to an extent that, you know, when things started to hurt, that if you just prayed enough that the pain would go away, but that's, that's not the case. God does not promise to save us from the pain, but he does promise to save us through it by working all of it for our good and for his glory, even when we don't feel it. So, you know, feeling pain in a sense shouldn't be a source of guilt to us. Uh, God's truth isn't meant to be a painkiller as much as it, is, as it is a guarantee of something beyond this, a sure hope to hold on to. And it may be the case for us that God has to take everything before we look at him as it was for Naomi. Her life is transformed ultimately by the love of God. At the start of the book of Ruth, Naomi has lost everything and she places no real value on Ruth. She seems to be thinking, what good is her love 
if I have just lost everything and everyone. Whereas at the end of the book, uh, the ladies of the town come and tell her how Ruth is more to her than seven sons. And this can be the trajectory of our lives as well, if we're open to God's work in us. You know, we, might start thinking, we might start off thinking, you know, what good is Jesus? What good is God if he can't give me what I want? But in the end, we might find ourselves thinking, I would gladly lose everything if that's what it takes to get him, if that's what it takes to get Jesus. Only the knowledge of God and his love by his spirit can do this in us. Our God suffered for us when we showed no concern or interest in him. And now he works for our good in our suffering to continue to show us what he is like and to show us his love, to keep shattering our human paradigms and ways of thinking and to grow in us a knowledge of him that creates a hope that can stand under any circumstance that comes. Let's pray. Our Father, we want to give you thanks for this book of Ruth that we can read to, to learn about you, to learn about your character, to learn about your love, Father, about how it doesn't fit into these categories that we have. It doesn't fit into human categories or patterns. It is not a love that comes to get something from us, but rather love that comes to give at its own cost. Father, it is through knowing this love, through coming to know you and the nature of your love, the nature of your uh, relationship with us and your commitment to us that can really start to transform our hearts to the deepest level and to change the way we respond to circumstances when they don't go our way. So I pray that you would do this in each of us. I pray that you would reveal more of yourself to us, reveal more of your love to us, and transform us, Father, so that when, when troubles come, so that we can suffer well, so that we can grow through the pain, grow in our knowledge of you, grow to, to see more of you, to love you more, to know you more, and so be transformed into into the image of your son, Father, which is the end of your work in us. So we give you thanks for him, for who he is, uh, and for this book of Ruth that you've given us. We give you thanks for all these things in his name. Amen.